humanitarian resilience, the need to develop sustainable national capacities through education and training. A 54-minute presentation held in the Wellington Hall Lecture Theatre at the Defence Academy, Shrivenham, on Wednesday the 5th of December 2007. The presenters are Mr Alistair McCaslin, Director Human Resilience, and his deputy, Ms Taz Grayling, whose work on humanitarian demining led to Cranfield University being awarded the 2007 Queen's Anniversary Prize for Higher and Further Education. The first presenter is Mr Alistair McCaslin. About 25 years ago, here at Shrivenham, Lieutenant Colonel George Ritchie was coming to the end of his uh, military service. And he was slightly concerned. He was looking forward to his retirement and second career with a degree of trepidation. By the way, he was a sapper, like, like many of the directing staff at the Old Royal Military College of Science. George was looking for a job, firstly, when he retired, that was in the sun, and secondly, where he could apply his, his sapper knowledge and skills and understanding in that particular way. About three or four weeks before he was due to, to leave, he suddenly had one of those Eureka experiences. And he suddenly thought, Barbados is a country that's in the sun. Barbados has, has natural uh, disasters, in particular hurricanes. Hurricanes knock down homes and engineers rebuild houses. So, the story goes, that he established an organisation here at Shipman which would enable him to go out to Barbados twice a year and would be able to deliver courses which would address how to prepare for, how to respond to and how to recover from natural disasters. And so the Cranfield Disaster Preparedness Centre was established. And over the years, that's morphed into the Cranfield Disaster Management Centre, which in turn has become Cranfield Mine Action and Disaster Management and more recently, Humanitarian Resilience. In this lecture, what Taz and I will be addressing is the challenges which affect individuals, organisations and states in the period of following a conflict, and we'll discuss how landmines and explosive remnants of war exacerbate these challenges. We'll look at the human cost and the developmental implications of post-conflict disasters. We'll then argue the case for a national capacity development, and in particular the need to develop the knowledge, the skills and the self-confidence of national managers who are responsible for planning and coordinating mine action and other disasters. Having established the case for capacity development, Taz and I will then discuss what we're doing and what we can do at Cranfield. We'll consider the capabilities which exist on both campuses and we'll comment on how these capabilities could be better coordinated in the future. Let me start by clarifying two key definitions we'll be using throughout this lecture. Firstly, mine action, and secondly, humanitarian resilience. Now, the term mine action first appeared about 10 years ago um, in an attempt to better describe the international community's response to the landmine problem. It's generally accepted that there are five pillars of mine action. The dominant pillar of mine action, or to be more precise, the part of mine action which is most costly, is that of humanitarian demining. Humanitarian demining includes those activities which involve finding, locating and mapping uh, the landmines and the UXO, and the subsequent clearance and then the handing over of the cleared land to local and national authorities. The second pillar is mine risk education, or MRE, as it's usually referred to. MRE is a process which encourages and enables a safe behaviour by communities at risk. The third pillar of mine action is victim assistance or survivor assistance, as we're meant to refer to it now to be politically correct. Survivor assistance includes rehabilitation and reintegration. The fourth pillar involves the destruction of stockpiles of landmines, in particular anti-personnel mines. This is an important part of the Ottawa Mine Ban Treaty, which aims to remove all anti-personnel mines, including stockpiles, as well as those that are buried in the ground. The fifth pillar of mine action involves advocacy. Initially, this focused very much on the landmines, the anti-personnel mines themselves, and you'll all recall the late Princess, uh, the late Diana Princess of Wales, whose main focus was on anti-personnel mines. But more recently, it's broadened its mandate to cover other nasty weapons of war, including cluster munitions, and I'll be referring, I'll be coming back to cluster munitions later on in our presentation. A number of other enabling activities are required to support these five pillars of mine action. 
These include assessment and planning, uh, the mobilization and prioritization of resources, information management, quality and risk management, and the development and deployment of safe, effective, and appropriate equipment. So mine action is not just about mine clearance. It's a holistic approach which involves projects to be prioritized, funding to be mobilized, resources to be allocated, uh, and complex multi-year programs of work to be developed, implemented, and coordinated. The second term we need to clarify is that of humanitarian resilience. Humanitarian resilience addresses the challenges from natural and human-made disasters which have an overwhelming humanitarian impact. This impact may be sudden uh, and immediately overwhelming, such as the 2004 tsunami in South Asia, or it may be caused by disasters with a slow onset with impact implications that last over many years. Humanitarian resilience is a subset of resilience, but the focus is very much on the individual, the affected individuals, and the affected communities, and in finding ways to mitigate the impact. Let us set the scene. Over 175 million landmines have been deployed since the end of World War II, including more than 65 million since 1980. Mines are seen by warring factions as attractive weapons of war, as they're relatively cheap to acquire, easy to lay, and invariably have a devastating effect on the target. But they differ from most other weapons by remaining active in the ground long after hostilities have ended. They lie in fields and woodlands, along roads and footpaths, and in villages, creating a humanitarian problem with social, economic, and environmental dimensions. In addition to the threat of landmines, many areas of former conflict are contaminated by submunitions, unexploded ammunition, missile fuels, discarded weapons, and other hazardous debris of war. The term minefield conjures up an image of a flat, open countryside in which rows of anti-tank and anti-personnel mines have been carefully laid, surveyed and recorded, and which are bounded by minefield fences marked with white tape and red warning triangles. In reality, the situation is quite different. Mines are often laid in a hurry by poorly trained and ill-equipped armies. Mines are rarely laid according to a pattern. Booby traps may have been set up. And the area may be scattered with other forms of unexploded ordnance, from small items such as phosphorus grenades to artillery shells and missiles containing a deadly cocktail of explosives and fuel. In some situations, the ground may be contaminated by scatterable mines, fired from mortars and artillery, or dropped from helicopters and aircraft. It is estimated that 2 million tons of bomblets were dropped from U.S. aircraft on Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand in the 1970s, aimed at disrupting movement along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The bomblets were anti-personnel devices designed to explode on impact with the ground, although it's now assessed that 25% failed to explode and they remain an ongoing hazard to communities. Of more recent concern is the use of cluster munitions. These are powerful weapons, often no larger than a mini can of cola, containing an explosive charge. They are packed into containers and dropped from aircraft or fired from artillery systems. Cluster munitions have a high failure rate, More than 20% fail to detonate on reaching the ground and remain hazardous until they are cleared. Large numbers were dropped in the Balkans, Afghanistan, Iraq, and more recently in the Lebanon. So after the guns fall silent, and when the mines in UXO no longer have a military purpose, the battlefield remains dangerous and explosive remnants of war have a major impact on communities attempting to recover from years of conflict. The victims of landmines and unexploded ordnance are inevitably the poorest and most vulnerable members of society. It is the subsistence farmer, nomads and their herds, fleeing refugees and the displaced, who are often the most affected. Economic necessity, indeed bare survival, forces people to enter known mined areas in search of food and water, to graze livestock, to cut wood, or to gather thatch for their homes. Moreover, those people who live and work among minefields are very often the same people who rely most on their physical fitness for work and who can least afford disabling injuries. Because landmines are designed to maim their victims, the kinds of wounds they cause often require extensive treatment for long periods of time. 
The medical and rehabilitation costs stemming from landmine casualties result in significant economic burden to both the state and to mine victims and their families. The impact of a mine explosion extends far beyond the individual casualty. From the moment of an incident, others are involved in evacuation and emergency care, in transport to the hospital, in surgery and post-operative treatment, and in rehabilitation services and vocational training. The human cost from landmines and other forms of unexploded ordnance is substantial. Landmines severely impede development. Not only do they take their toll on victims and families, but the presence of landmines in and around communities, on roads, in farmland and near rivers and wells prevents the productive use of land, water and infrastructure for development. In fact, it was NGOs working on development projects in areas contaminated by mines in the 1980s that first alerted field workers to the scale of the humanitarian problem. Deforestation has been accelerated by extensive use of landmines, where arable land has been mined to such a degree that forests become the only source of livelihood, the long-term investment in forests and fruit trees gives way to the immediate pressures to survive. Landmines have also threatened the already fragile environments of some rare animals. This includes the snow leopard in Afghanistan and gorillas in the Congo. Ironically, it's the countries where the landmine problem is most severe that face other significant development problems such as Angola, Afghanistan, Bosnia, Cambodia, the Caucasus, the Horn of Africa, Laos, Sudan and Vietnam. Beyond the direct costs of clearance, mine risk education and victim assistance are the wider economic and social costs. Poor rural post-conflict societies can be quickly overwhelmed by the challenges of repairing infrastructure and replacing lost agricultural production. In short, Explosive remnants of war perpetuate poverty and are a major obstacle to sustainable development. Over 1,000 square kilometres of land have been cleared of mines and unexploded ordnance since the start of humanitarian demining some 15 years ago. It's also estimated that about 150 square kilometres were cleared last year. In addition to that, about 300 square kilometres of unexploded ordnance were cleared last year. Now, this is a remarkable achievement and it's a significant improvement over previous years. But a massive challenge remains. Explosive remnants of war are a major humanitarian threat, as Taz has explained, with adverse developmental implications. This challenge will continue for many, many years, long after international interest and funding has moved on to address other issues and topical humanitarian concerns. A key responsibility of the international community is to assist mine-affected countries to develop effective and resilient national capacities which will enable them to address the landmine problem over many, many years to come. Now, capacity development is a broad concept which enables individuals, groups, organisations, institutions and society to increase their ability to manage the problem and to take ownership of the solution. Now, mine action and disaster management it involves the introduction of appropriate national laws and standards, the development of systems of governance and coordination, and the ability of national authorities to mobilise resources from national budgets. Moreover, it involves the development of national managers through education, through training, and through coaching. Cranfield University assumes a leading role in developing national capacity through education, training, and coaching in promoting and enabling the advancement of management thinking, of providing, through example, a strong leadership role within its network of regional and local academic partners. Now, the management of mine action at the national level is essentially about ensuring that programs, projects, and indeed day-to-day -day mine action activities are carried out effectively, efficiently, and safely. This involves defining the requirements through assessment missions and site surveys, by prioritising requirements, by developing plans, by securing funding, by implementing projects and confirming that the requirements have been met. Now, in many ways, the, the management of mine action has advanced significantly in recent years. There are international standards for mine action, and indeed those standards were partly developed here um, at Shrivenham some uh, nine or ten years ago. There's also an accepted international mine action management system that is used by nearly all mine-affected countries in the world, and training for over 1, 
thousand national managers have been produced or have been provided by, by this university and our partners. Indeed, other sectors view mine action as providing benchmarks of quality in the management of humanitarian and developmental work uh, to which they aspire. However, many challenges remain. And the university works closely with national authorities to improve the planning capacities by adopting advanced management systems. What I'd now like us to do is to describe some of these management approaches and the tools that we've prepared at Cranfield to assist in the development of national capacities. In 2000 and 2001, the university assisted the National Demining Commission of Yemen to develop a long-term plan for its mine action program by building on the rich source of socioeconomic data collected during the nationwide landmine impact study conducted in 1999 and 2000. Since then, the university has assisted national authorities develop mine action strategies in many countries from Afghanistan to Yemen. Central to this assistance is the university's strategic planning model, a unique yet relatively straightforward method of developing a range of strategic options for national mine action programs. The model requires national planners to formally assess the needs and expectations of those most closely involved in the program and to analyze the factors which will influence the successful achievement of the long-term vision and mid-term objectives. Planners are required to develop a range of strategic options in a transparent manner. The university doesn't write the plan. Instead, we guide, assist and mentor national managers to develop their own plans, often building on the experience of national staff who have previously attended a senior mine action managers course here at Shrivenham. A typical example of our strategic planning work is our assistance to the government of Iraq to develop a long-term national mine action strategy. The university has developed computer-based tools to assist the strategic planning process. These tools are not silver bullets which automatically generate a strategic plan. Rather, they insist to the planners to calculate the program costs and to predict the measurable outputs. This requires the planner to review the program's current capabilities and expected future capabilities over the period of the strategic plan. The tools encourage planners to obtain and verify real data on location and extent of land contamination, on casualties, and on the socioeconomic impact of the contamination at community and national levels, and by so doing, develop better, more affordable, and more defensible plans. The need for mine action organizations to have an effective quality management system should be self-evident. International mine action standards encourage, and in some places require, the adoption of a quality management system. In particular, the definition of clearance is predicated on the need for clearance organizations to be accredited and monitored, for the clearance requirements to be defined and agreed in advance, and for post-clearance inspections to be carried out to confirm that the requirement has been met. Many donors require mine action contractors, both commercial and NGOs, to define in some detail their quality management systems, although there is currently no consistency in how this is achieved. The mine action community applies performance measures to programs and projects, but there is no consistency in how the measures are applied, or the indicators used, or how to interpret the information gathered. The need to measure performance in mine action is gathering universal currency. The new UN Interagency Strategic Plan stresses the importance of determining targets and using performance indicators to monitor progress and to determine success. Donors recognize the need to define and measure outputs and outcomes of mine action projects, in particular those in support of development goals. The US government has recently invited the university to evaluate models of quality management and assess their potential application to mine action and to develop guidelines for the use of quality management in US funded mine action projects. They've also invited us to evaluate performance measures assess their potential application to mine action and develop guidelines for the use of performance measurement in US funded mine action projects. As the landmine problem is an environmental concern, very often preventing other humanitarian action from taking place, it's envisaged that this work on quality management and performance measurement will apply to the broader disaster management sector. Mine action is essentially about the management of risk. It involves the gathering of information to determine the form, the degree, the extent, and the perception of risk. 
It involves an assessment of the possible methods to reduce the risk to a level that's deemed to be acceptable to the affected communities. National authorities and donors are also interested in the perception of risk. It involves measuring the effectiveness of interventions by both national and international organisations, and it involves making adjustments to the programmes, projects and tasks to reflect the lessons learned. So if the statement is true, why do we shy away from accepting the concept of risk management to mine action? Have we been programmed to accept the unrealistic goal of a mine-free world as advocated by the Mine Ban Treaty fundamentalists? Or is it because we now, in the West, certainly expect decision-makers to protect us from all forms of risk, be they natural hazards, terrorist attacks, carcinogenic chemicals, or explosive remnants of war? We all aspire to live in a safer and a more benign world. We have increased expectations of safety and a growing belief that we can really control our fate through technology and through regulations. For some, the very idea of us accepting any degree of residual risk is considered to be reprehensible. The requirement for total clearance leading to a mine-free world has become the mantra of the mine action planners and practice for the past decade. But the tide of opinion is turning. There is a growing acceptance that a mine-free world will never be possible and there are increasing demands from donors to find smarter ways of targeting finite resources to the mine threat and thus reducing the humanitarian impact. The challenge we face in mine action is, is to understand how best to use the concept of risk in a meaningful way to assist mine action managers to prioritise projects, to determine the levels of acceptable risk and design procedures which will release land in which the residual risk is deemed to be acceptable and tolerable to local communities. How the terms acceptable and tolerable are difficult to define. They imply human judgment of a situation, and judgment may be tentative, it may be transient, and it may be fallible. Who, for example, will decide what is acceptable risk in a mine-affected country? Will it be the national mine action authorities? Will it be the affected communities themselves? Will it be technical advisors on behalf of the mine affected communities? Or indeed, will it be the donors who are creating demands and how the money is spent? Will the perception of acceptable risk change over time from a country as it transitions from an immediate post-conflict setting to one of peace and stability? What I'd now like to do is to describe, using a case study, the work that we're doing here at Shriven to apply our thinking a risk to a practical problem. In early 2005, Shell, Shell International Limited, obtained the rights to participate with the National Oil Corporation of Libya in the exploration and production of liquefied natural gas in the major oil and gas producing Serta Basin region of Libya. And some of you who flick through the back pages of the newspaper will notice there's a seriously large amount of oil sitting both in the water and just on shore in the Serta Bay. Now, during the Second World War, this area around Mersa Brega and El Alhila, which is at the bottom end of the Serta Bay, was heavily defended by the Axis powers of Germany and Italy, using a very large number of landmines. Now, based on available information, Shell assessed that uh, there was an indeterminate number of mines and unexploded ordnance remaining in this area, not helped by maps which demonstrated or suggested that there were very large quantities of mines and unexploded ordnance. In June 2005, the university was awarded a contract to undertake a survey and assessment of the area of seismic interest. The purpose of the assessment was to provide general information and advice that would assist Shell to develop a strategy and the plans to mitigate the risks from explosive remnants to the people, vehicles and equipment engaged in seismic surveys. Just to give you an idea, each of these little beasties with several wheels cost nearly two million pounds and so it was in the interest to make sure that there was nothing explosive in front of the wheels. The assessment was undertaken in four phases over three months. Phase one was conducted in the UK and involved the collection and analysis of historical data um, from various sources including the library up at the Staff College, uh, the National Archives at Kew and the German Minister of Defence very kindly lent us some information. Phase two was undertaken in Tripoli and involved meetings with Shell International Limited of Libya uh, and other relevant agencies and organisations, both Libyan governmental and commercial. Phase three was undertaken in the areas of seismic interest 
and involved Rob padding around with some 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 helpers. Um, and the, the aim was to visit a, a sample of potentially hazardous areas and have discussions with representatives of local authorities and impacted communities, including goat shepherds. And this is where Rob's amazing ability to learn foreign languages quickly was particularly helpful. Phase four, which was conducted in the UK, established results and proposed recommendations to Shell. The university was thus able to identify areas which are probably still hazardous and pose a, a clear and present danger to seismic operations, areas which are potentially hazardous, and areas that don't appear to pose a threat to seismic operations. The study provided immediate benefits to Shell, but the, but the lessons learned have a much wider impact within and outside mine action. In particular, the study has led to follow-on work by Cranfield through and into developing quantitative methods of assessing the risk to Shell's field staff and seismic equipment to support the company's health and safety policy and practice. We've already spoken about the effect landmines have on the environment within humanitarian action takes place. And now I'd like to turn to the, the environment in a more classic sense. The effect of landmines and of mine action on flora and fauna and on natural resources. Landmines and unexploded ordnance are, by definition, a form of contamination. They damage our environment, including arable land, watercourses, roads, and residential land. And like other forms of environmental contamination, finite resources have to be allocated to reduce and ideally to remove the explosive remnants of war. There's been considerable debate on the possible environmental effects from the destruction of mines and munitions, especially during stockpile destruction in accordance with the Ottawa Mine Ban Treaty. Where mines are destroyed by open burning, the gaseous products of detonation uh, or burning are released into the air. Now, the Soviet PFM-1 antipersonnel mine contains a liquid that is both toxic and corrosive and whose products of combustion or detonation are also toxic. And indeed, some work was done for the United Nations and the Geneva International Centre by Ian Wallace's department about four or five years ago to establish the degree and form and scope of that toxicity. However, the detonation products of most TNT or RDX filled mines are very similar in nature to the combustion products of fuels for cars and aircraft and therefore produce certainly relatively very little additional contamination. Now, over time, the explosive products from buried mines and unexploded ordnance will leach into the groundwater, resulting in localised environmental damage. Some commercial destruction or demilitarization techniques favor dismantling the mine, removing the bulk explosive for commercial use and the recycling of some of the plastics used in the mine bodies. Despite the income generated by the recycling process, the costs per mine are usually well in excess of open detonation techniques. Concerns are often expressed on the environmental impact of machines used to process, I use the word process, the ground, such as mine rollers, flails, earth tillers, sifters, and plows. The mechanical action of such machines can have long-term implications on the structure of the soils and could damage vegetation and fauna. Indeed, concerns on the potential environmental impact from mine clearance was a key issue that we addressed during a survey that we conducted in the Falkland Islands at the end of last year. And if any of you have not been to the Falkland Islands at this particular time of the year, it benefits from a hole in the ozone layer. And I hadn't realized when I was down there that about four hours in the sun in the Falkland Islands can actually make your skin peel instantly. As you know, the armed forces of Argentina laid anti-personnel and anti-tank mines during the occupation of the Falkland Islands back in 1982. Most were laid on the approaches to Port Stanley, but others were laid in and around the settlements of Goose Green, Fox Bay and Port Howard, and the coves of the Murrell Peninsula, which is just above Stanley on the, on the eastern coast. Now, the British government has got an obligation under the Ottawa Treaty to report on the extent and the form of the threat from anti-personnel mines in the Falklands, and subsequently clearing the mines. And as some of you may know, having been watching the telly and reading the newspapers, this is the 10th anniversary of the signing of the Ottawa Treaty, and there's a lot of focus on governments like the UK 
expecting them to be able to state why they have done something or why they have not done something, and hence their interest in promoting the survey a year ago. Now, so we were invited by the British and the Argentine governments to carry out a survey of the islands which aimed to clarify the extent of the technical problem and to propose a set of clearance options. Now, central to this study was the need for our survey team to report on the environmental implications of clearance and, in particular, the environmental implications of using mechanical systems to locate and to remove the mines. The survey team consisted of six people, three from this campus, from Shrivenham, and three from a combination of Silsa and Cranfield, because the staff were moving across from Silsa to Cranfield at the time. We also had four observers attached to the team, two provided by the British government and two provided by the Argentine government. As you may know, the two major sources of income for the Falklands are fishing rights and tourism. Now, it's hoped that in the future there's a, there'll be a lot of oil offshore, but that's yet to materialise. The tourist trade is focused on the flora and fauna found on the islands, on the two main islands, but also on some of the smaller islands, and in particular, the unique categories of penguin. Now, military training areas in the UK, as I'm sure many will know, have become a haven for flora and fauna, which seem to be surprisingly resilient uh, to the presence of large green vehicles charging around firing their guns. And so in the Falklands, rare flora and fauna have become rather strange bedfellows to landmines. Or to be more precise, the minefield fence uh, guards the flora and fauna from large numbers of sheep and from the farmers' vehicles. Our final report to the British and to the Argentine government addresses the potential damage caused to the environment during demining activities and makes recommendations on the trade-off between clearance effectiveness, speed, cost, and potential environmental damage. We also propose ways of conducting environmental remediation. We feel that the management of risk and the environment will become ever more important in mine action once the immediate humanitarian needs have been addressed. On both campuses at Cranfield, we have a unique set of capabilities which we can and I believe we should exploit to address this future requirement. The university has been involved for a number of years in the development and testing of mine detection and clearance technologies. Initially, in support of equipment primarily for military use, but with some application for humanitarian demining. But more recently, the university has become involved in assisting in the development of systems designed primarily for the humanitarian sector. One recent example of our work in the development is the development of an improved method of neutralising mines and unexploded ordnance. In 2005, a UK-based company called Disarmco contracted Ian Wallace's department to develop a pyrotechnic device to disarm anti-personnel mines. The device, known as Dragon, is positioned immediately above the exposed or partially exposed mine and it detects a very hot, focused flame at the munitions outer casing, causing it to burn rather than to detonate. The Dragon torch can be manufactured in mine-affected countries using low-cost materials which are readily available. In 1998, the United Nations sponsored a study to identify the management skills and knowledge needed by national mine action planners and to propose options for delivering mine action management training. As a result of this study, the United Nations Development Programme invited the university to develop management training courses aimed at senior managers and mid-level managers of mine action programmes. In July 2000, at the request of UNDP, we delivered at Shrivenham a pilot course for senior mine action managers. The curriculum and many of the training materials were developed by Sylvie Jackson, and we would like to applaud and thank Sylvie for her outstanding contribution to mine action management training. It's also important at this point to stress the major contribution made by Anne Fitzgerald, Terry McConville and Derek Neal during those early years and, of course, Trevor Taylor for taking the financial risk and showing the vision to support the formation of a mine action capability here at Shrivenham. We feel it's also important to stress the contribution of the military by providing a Colonel Mike McAlpine for six months and for encouraging students of the former Division II course to carry out related studies. Indeed, it was the Staff College project which provided the initial justification for Cranfield to become involved back in 1998. Since the first course was delivered in 2000, 
A further four international courses for senior managers have been held in the UK. Four courses have been delivered by a partner university in the US, and one regional course has been delivered by Ljubljana University in Slovenia. The first course for mid-level managers was delivered in Mozambique in 2001 and 2002, and a further 36 courses have been held in Afghanistan, Cambodia, Georgia, Iraq, Jordan, Kenya, Mozambique, Pakistan, Slovenia, and Thailand. A key shift in emphasis in management training has been the localization of training materials to meet regional and national needs. We've conducted formal training assessments in Afghanistan, Angola, Cambodia, Iraq, and Laos, and in the Sudan Mine Action Program. Indeed, Sudan is a good current example where the university, working with the International Mine Action Training Center in Kenya, and the UN Mine Action Office in Sudan, delivered ten courses in 2006 and 2007. We will be delivering further training in 2008, with 400,000 US dollars coming from the US Department of State, and another 550,000 US dollars coming from the UN. Although the focus of the university's work is in the development of national capacities, we provide management training courses for international managers and technical advisors of the United Nations, international NGOs, commercial companies. And to military officers working in humanitarian and development programs. From 2008, the International Technical Advisors Course will become a module on the university's MSc in Resilience, and graduates will be awarded credits towards the degree and the university's postgraduate diploma and certificate. The university will be launching an MSc in Resilience in early 2008. The course is aimed at professional managers who wish to apply rigorous academic thought to practical problems in their sector, and to acquire the necessary knowledge and skills to analyse threats and to build resilient organisations and systems. The course includes an elective module on managing post-conflict challenges, which has been designed for national and international managers operating in mine-affected countries. Students on the course include graduates of the university's national mine action management training programmes. While it's、um, relatively easy to list our work in the、uh, development of national capacities, in particular the training of national managers, let me bring this work into sharp focus through a case study by discussing our support to Mohammed Sadiq in Afghanistan. Sadiq was born in Kabul in March 1970 to an educated middle-class family. He went to the Ghulam Haider Khan High School and graduated with the equivalent. Of four A levels when he was just 18 years old, and just prior to the Soviet withdrawal from his country and the 10-year civil war which followed, had the circumstances been different, Sadiq would almost certainly have gone on to study at university, perhaps to become a doctor or an engineer, but that was not to be. Sadiq's first appointment in mine action was as a de miner and surveyor with the Mine Clearance and Planning Agency, which is an Afghan NGO established. In early 1989, when it became apparent that the country was heavily contaminated by landmines, during the early days of mine action in Afghanistan, the work of surveyors and deminers was a particularly dangerous occupation, with only limited access to international technical advisers. Sadiq's technical skills improved, and he was promoted to survey team leader and then to operations assistant at the agency's area office. Later, moving to become the operations assistant with the United Nations Mine Action Office in Kandahar. In March 2002, Sadiq attended a six-week course for mid-level managers in Peshawar, which was delivered by Cranford University. Just actually at the time that I joined the university, it was my my first overseas mission. On graduation, he was promoted to manager of the UN Area Office in Eastern Afghanistan. A year later, in 2003, he was given the opportunity to come to Shrivenham to attend a six-week course for senior mine action managers, and he attended that along with 19 other managers from 15 mine affected countries. On graduation, Sadiq was promoted to become the senior national operations officer at the UN Mine Action Centre in Kabul. In November 2006, he was further promoted to become chief of operations, and at the time, that was the most senior national mine action manager in Afghanistan. Next year, Sadiq will become a student on our MSc in Resilience. Sadiq is an example of an individual that we at Cranfield partner with. We take them through from mid-level to senior level to master's level education. It's a true partnership and a true investment in people.
In this lecture, Taz and I have described the mine action work we do in humanitarian resilience, which really falls into the disaster mitigation and response components of our work. In other areas of disaster management, we use a similar rationale to ensure that our capabilities and our work come together in a way that's driven by needs and by demand, not by supply. I like to think of our capabilities of work coming together as shown on the slide that I'm going to build up for you. And let me describe the elements of the diagram. At the very core of our organisation is our advanced thinking in humanitarian resilience. That thinking is driven by the external environment. It's by, driven by issues such as the laws, it's driven by conditions, opinions and needs. That thinking, of course, is not con conducted in isolation and it, it interacts with other thinking that takes place on this campus or the other campus and on the military components that exist on this campus, such as the Doctrine Centre, but also in other universities as well. And there should be a, a creative interaction between what we're doing and what others are doing at, at master's level thinking. Now, the outputs of that thinking is a series of, of activities uh, and projects. Short courses, it could be consultancy work, um, it could be assessments. And these are the outputs, uh, these are the products and services, these are the outputs of the, of the thinking that, that is done. With effect from next year, some of that work will be focused through the MSc in resilience. There will be two major components of that. The firstly will be the post-conflict module, but also together with Tony Moore, the two modules that relate to disaster management. These products and services are not ends in themselves. These products and services ultimately lead to outcomes of beneficiaries. And we can think of a range of beneficiaries from the individual managers in country through to the potential victims, through to those that are affected by the developmental implications, the D-miners themselves and their managers, the National Mine Action Authorities, and indeed even the United Nations. And the relationship between it, these outputs and services is not straightforward because a number of these products and services will actually enable benefits to be achieved in a number of those categories down the bottom. What's particularly important, though, is that we get constant feedback from our outputs and from our outcomes. Because this thinking here does not just happen because people go and lock themselves in their office or go home to think or occasionally deal with people in the office next door or in another department. It gains its real authority by being nourished by the experience of people in the field and by people that we teach, people that we deliver services to. So it's not a linear approach to developing and implementing work. It's a continual feedback mechanism which enables that area there to be thoroughly nourished. Now, the military among you will say, big deal. That's what the military do all the time with doctrine. Doctrine gets constantly refreshed as a result of feedback through training and operational experience. And I would argue that's exactly the same model that we practice in humanitarian resilience. I'd now like to move on to the capabilities that exist on this campus and on the other campus and how these capabilities can provide uh, benefits to the same categories and groups that we discussed before. And as I explained the last time, it's a complex relationship. It's a complex relationship because there are a number of the things that we do on this campus and on the other campus impact and influence the same groups of beneficiaries. Now, do we do this well? Do we do this well on this campus? Do we actually coordinate in an effective way so that we all understand what those capabilities are and that we all know how those capabilities can be grouped together through clusters of capability? I would argue that in some areas that we do it quite well and in other areas, frankly, we don't do it anything like as well as we could or we should. This is just an example of something that we did just over a year ago. And what we try to do is we try to map on the capabilities along the top of all the resilience capabilities that existed within uh, the department, uh, together with other capabilities that existed outside the department. And down the left-hand side, down the, the vertical sector, there is the areas of provision. And you see in here we identify those capabilities which we believe led, those capabilities which were 
engaged and those capabilities that were interested in becoming involved. Now, I would argue that this sort of exercise is something that we should refresh uh, and something that we should understand and know and be able to deal with one another by having some sort of overall mapping. And we may want to pick this particular point up during the, the question and discussion period shortly. So humanitarian resilience has been in existence at Shrivenham in some form or other for, for nearly 30 years. Our understanding of the requirement has evolved over time and we've developed new capabilities to address new challenges. This includes the threat from landmines and unexploded ordnance, as well as other disaster management challenges such as climate change, urban risk, food security, and public health. Now, we are a unique organization at a unique location where we work with others at Cranfield University uh, and can share our ideas with our military colleagues in the Defense Academy. Indeed, it's this uniqueness as well as the exceptional commitment of members of our team at Shrivenham, which has led to us being awarded the 2007 Queen's Anniversary Prize just two weeks ago. Naturally, we're, we're very pleased to be awarded the prize, but we will not rest on our laurels. Indeed, we will use the award as a point of departure for further and broader involvement in humanitarian resilience with our academic colleagues on both campuses and with our military colleagues at Shrivenham. Alastair McCaslin and Taz Grayling were asked the following five questions. Question 1. The Ottawa Treaty was a seismic shift in mine action. Has there been a similar shift in the last ten years, or do you foresee any in the future? Not like the effect that the Ottawa Treaty had. And indeed the Ottawa Treaty is still through a series of difficult stages and phases. You know, the really big bears like the United States, China, India, Pakistan uh, and Russia have not yet signed up. But what it has done is stigmatised a weapon. I think in those days we, frankly, did not consider what happened after the missile, the mine, the weapon system had done its job. In those days we were more worried about the nuclear war that would start after seven or eight years in the Central Front. We put a huge amount of effort into making sure that weapon systems were safe before they were fired, but really didn't worry too much about the effect afterwards. Now, the ripple effects, I think, of the Ottawa Treaty are in cluster munitions. And I think we're all being forced to, to look at our hearts and our souls and ask as to whether the benefits outweigh the potential disadvantages of systems like that. I think that that is a, a movement that will not be stopped. I think it will roll on, and I think we're going to have to invest considerably greater amounts of money in our weapon systems to ensure that the effects, when, they, when they're no longer acquired, are taken just as importantly as should they fail to operate effectively when we're operating. Question two. You mentioned the measures that you're looking at to be able to return land to use when there is still some risk of mines being present and people being injured. Can you talk more about how you make those assessments and what is an acceptable risk? If I knew the immediate answer to that, I could win a, a very large contract for Cranfield University. As I was suggesting in my presentation, there is a change of view. A few years ago, the mine ban fundamentalists said, it's everything or nothing. There is now an acceptance that, that there is not enough money to frankly look for every last mine in the world. So what we have to do is find means of, of prioritizing our resources and looking at those, that, those areas that represent the greatest risk. There are a, a couple of studies that are being done at the moment. One of them is being conducted by the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining. Uh, and Matt Craig, a colleague of mine, has actually been providing some quality assurance on the work that they've been doing. And basically they have been looking at the easy bit of risk, which in other words, to look at information which was incorrectly put into information management systems to suggest that there was the possibility of there being mines. And actually then refreshing that information by saying, well actually, that should never have been put in the first place and therefore we will release that land for use by the public. So very, very low risk because the original assumptions for the information being put in there in the first place were wrong. The next category, however, is much more difficult. And if you imagine Afghanistan, if, if you imagine the map of Afghanistan, just north of Kabul, there's the Shamali Plains. And the Shamali Plains is where most of the, the battles took place in the sort of two or three months before the liberation of the country. And in that area, there were small numbers of mines put down. They were not marked, they were not fenced, they were not recorded, and indeed various planes drop nasty bits and pieces. There it becomes much more difficult because you can establish a risk model at the national level 
you could be comfortable with. In other words, you can say, the chance of somebody stepping in a mine, the probability of somebody stepping in a mine, a goat shepherd stepping in a mine in that area, is one person per ten years. And indeed, it's the same sort of calculations that take place here in the UK in terms of the, the probability of there being an accident at a roundabout. It's much more difficult to get away with that argument if you're dealing with NGOs. Because every single person who could step on a mine could potentially be harmed. And indeed, hopefully next week, we'll be writing a project proposal for the US Department of State. We'll be proposing a, uh, some work that will address that particular issue. Our colleagues in the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining did a body swerve around that issue. It's one of those incredibly difficult issues when you're dealing with NGOs because they'll become understandably emotional about one individual stepping in a mine. At the donor level and at national authorities level, they'll be able to stand back and look at it in a bigger picture. The real challenge is going to be to find this issue of what's acceptable risk because what is acceptable today might not be acceptable in a few years' time. Question three. Is Cranfield University doing much at the moment on the technical side of detection and clearance? When I arrived six years ago, there was an opportunity for us as a university to become involved in a major project to do with the testing and evaluation. And I hate to say it, we were beaten by kinetic on that particular issue. I think if we bid for it again, we'd win. But to some extent, at the UN level, we were shut out for about two or three years. Now, that contract has come to an end. In fact, Ian and I were talking in the corridor about a week ago, and, and we believe that we need to re-energise that. We need to look at all those capabilities that exist on the campus and bring them together, as I was suggesting there, in a sort of holistic way. Question four. Have there been any developments for detecting mines by satellite? Not a lot. I was involved in that to a degree. There was a lot promised about seven, eight years ago, and we're very much against the laws of physics here. Do you want to be able to have granularity in detail, but also look deeply into the ground, or do you want to go deeply into the ground but not get the granularity of detail? Now, anti-personnel mines are about two inches across, two and a half inches across, some of them. You know, the laws of physics just will not allow you to see that, even from Richard Branson's airship, and he invested a lot of money to try and get something out of it. What we didn't do was actually exploit the potential capabilities. And what we should have said was, look, we can't find mines, but we can find the presence of military activity which will demonstrate the presence of mines. And we didn't establish at that stage that that's a causal relationship between, between the two. And I, that's where I think we should go back and revisit issues. You know, we talked about land release. We talked about uh, taking the risk of releasing land. Well, rather than having people on the ground looking for areas of evidence of potential uh, activity. Why not remap it? You know, we, we see these fantastic maps of, of Roman digs and activities that have taken place. Could we do something similar in the areas where there is a low probability of there being mines and therefore then being able to discount with a reasonable degree of confidence, a high level of probability, that there are no mines there? So I think we can use that technology, but not to look for individual mines, but to look for the general presence of mines. Question five. Is there a country that has been declared free of mines? Kosovo, for example. Kosovo hasn't. Halo claimed that it still had some mines around. It would be very, very difficult for any country with its hand in its heart to say that it's completely clear. What it can do, I think, is state that it's clear of the impact. If you take the Falkland Islands, you know, is the impact great? Not really. In fact, when I was down the Falklands last year, some of the locals said, actually, if you remove the landmines, that would create a, a negative impact because we've got lots of people who come down here to do battlefield tours and they expect to see landmines. They expect to see fences and said, even if we had to remove all the landmines to satisfy the Ottawa Treaty, we'd probably still put up fences and marking <laughs> to give people the impression that they're there. Alistair McCaslin can be contacted by email at a.r.r.mccaslin, spelt Mike, Charlie, Alpha, Sierra, Lima, Alpha, November, at cramfield.ac.uk. Taz Grayling can be contacted by email at t.grayling, spelt Golf, Romeo, Echo, Yankee, Lima, India, November, Golf, at cramfield.ac.uk. Dot UK.